Good morning. What a delight it is to have a full chapel again now that students are back on campus. Uh, my name is Reverend Jenny Peak, and I'm the associate pastor here at the University Church in Yale. And it is so good to be together again in 2023 for a new semester. Uh, it's wonderful to see some uh, old faces that have been with us for decades that have returned to visit and some new faces, some new students that are, uh, have maybe uh, stumbled into us this semester. We're so glad to have you. Um, if you are new, please fill out one of our yellow sheets and you can give it to Reverend Ian or I after church or put it in the offering basket. We would love to have the chance to get to know you more. Today is a very uh, wonderful and celebrated day in the life of our church because today is the day that we are commissioning our student deacons. Uh, 17 of us were out on the ocean Friday and Saturday on retreat, uh, preparing for this day and preparing for a new year for our student deacons to be the servant leaders of our church. Uh, so after the sermon, we will have the opportunity to bless them. And it's fun to see we have some deacon uh, emeritus, some deacon alums in the house too. If you're a deacon emeritus, can you raise your hand for us? Yeah, Sarah and Jonathan, woo woo! <laughs> Good to still have you here. Um, now let's take a breath and prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. It is good to be together in a place of beauty, a place of silence, and a place of song. I invite you to stand in body or spirit and join me in our call to worship. The voice of God gathers us this day. We come with our joy and our sorrow. We come seeking to be nourished and sustained. Listen, God is calling. Come, let us worship.
beloved friends here at UCY, we come together in a weekly communal confession. At this time, we reorient our hearts and our minds and our actions towards God. Please join me in this prayer confession. Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our hearts, our soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong that we have done and the good that we have left undone. Lord, you are full of compassion and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous to mercy. There is always forgiveness with you. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give us light to minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Speak to each of us and let your word abide with us until it is wrought in us your holy will. Amen. Beloved, through Christ and by grace, we are eternally forgiven. Be freed in the knowledge that nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God. As Miss Abby just shared with us all, Christ came and brought peace, peace to the world for all of us to share. Friends, please join me in sharing the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is, is to each of you say, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did not baptize also the household Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be in view of its power. For the message of, about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of God for the people of God.
invite you all to stand now as you're able for the acclamation. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the lake, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness has seen a great light and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death light has dawned from that time jesus began to proclaim repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near as he walked by the sea of galilee he saw two brothers simon who is called peter and andrew his brother casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the good news of the gospel. Amen. You may be seated. It is so good to see you all back and see the full choir back. Ah, a new semester begins. Let's all take a breath. We can do this. Even spring semester at Yale. Beginnings like this are always a kind of a decision point. How will this semester be different from the ones that went before? In a sudden rush of demands and events and schedules, will I fall back into patterns I know aren't good for me? Or will this semester be the one that changes? Will I win the battle to center my life differently? Or will the schedule and the pressure triumph once again? In this early season of the church year, our scriptures take us back to the very first decision points in Jesus's ministry, the very, very beginning. As he begins preaching and touching people and calls his first disciples, perhaps these stories can teach us something to fit our own decisions about how the semester and this year will go. Also, these stories of the call of the first disciples help us reflect on today's commissioning of our new and returning student deacons. Pastor Jenny and I spent the weekend with them on retreat, and they are a big, remarkable group of students called in amazing and diverse ways to serve here. Now, last week, we also did call. Last week, it was John's version. 
of the very start of Jesus' ministry and the call of those disciples. And today we hear from Matthew. It's a very different story. In Matthew, Jesus sets out on his ministry and begins gathering followers in response to hard times, to troubling news. John the Baptist, who blazed the prophetic trail that Jesus is walking, who baptized Jesus and first testified to him, has been arrested by Herod Antipas, the Roman-sponsored ruler of Galilee, for criticizing the political order and the religious order in the Roman Empire itself. Now you think Jesus' response would have been to lay low in fear of his own arrest. But instead he takes up John's mantle and moves from Nazareth to Capernaum by the sea and begins teaching and reaching out and touching people and blessing everyone he encounters. Matthew quotes Isaiah. You might have heard this, these strange names of Zebulun and Naphtali. That's all from Isaiah, who preaches about this little northern corner of Israel where Jesus is, traditionally given to the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali. And that famous quote scripture that we hear about the people who sat in darkness, that's what this is about. But it's about way back in Isaiah's time, how that was the first territory that the Assyrian Empire destroyed. So we're talking to the people of that time and place and saying, the light is coming. Now, Matthew uses the same quote about this time and place, about the people who walked in darkness, who have seen a great light on those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has shined. Now Jesus has come to the same corner of Israel and Matthew's using the same quote to confront the new Assyrians, the Roman empire, with the promise that God will bring light and hope where there was only oppression and destruction. And so Jesus starts preaching one line, in Matthew's gospel, just one line. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's a deceptively simple message, but a compelling one. It says, this is the time, now, when God will act. And empires will totter, and the poor will hear good news, and the love of God for all people will turn the whole world upside down. Jesus says, now is the time. We are at that thin place, that crucial moment where God is breaking into history and all Jesus says is, will you follow me? And as the story goes, he does encounter young men and we know also young women and says to them, follow me. And the story says these young people drop everything and immediately follow him. It's very Gospel of Mark, everything's immediately. Notice, notice that word, immediately. It sounds almost unreal. It's like those Bible movies, you know, the preacher, teacher appears and the music starts going and, the, and he, has, he has very intense eyes and he says a few words and everyone's eyes are opened and they drop everything. They leave behind their boats and their nets and their families and follow him. However we retell that story, what I wonder is, what was it about the mystery of that call, about the hearts of those young people, about the beauty of that message that could inspire such a response? And it makes me wonder about myself. Could I do that? Could we do that? Could we decide in a moment to change, to follow, to believe in ways that we're not doing yet, to fulfill the spiritual longings we already have to set out on an unplanned journey inspired by parables and pictures. Of course, the story of the call of the disciples was 2000 years ago in a very different place in time, but Jesus' call to follow him exists in an eternal time, in an open time. The message wasn't just for them, but also for us today. Hear this good news, God is breaking into the world and we can listen and believe and follow and turn and change, or we can stay as we are. So my main message today is that if the call came to me today, as I think it is coming, I think I would find very good reasons to defer. First, I think if the call came to me to follow, I would say, I'm not ready. I need to know more, I need to pray more, I need to believe more, I need to be a better person, I need to be a better Christian before I really commit to this predicted kingdom. The call, it's for those really religious people over there. You know them, they're really religious, not me. 
Delmer Chilton tells the story about his first call as a Methodist pastor, fresh out of seminary. And he says he cleaned himself up and shaved off his scraggly beard and actually bought a black suit and a white shirt and necktie because he decided he was going to be the model pastor he'd heard about. But the first year didn't go well and the call imploded. And a year later, he found himself assigned to a new church. He tells a story about driving to that new church and he pulls off the road. He said that he's about to get there and he has a talk with Jesus about what's gonna happen. He says, I thought you'd call me Jesus to be the perfect pastor, but that clearly didn't work. I didn't realize you weren't calling the perfect pastor, you were calling me, Delmer. As I am, warts and all, not to become something else, but just to be Delmer as a pastor. And that's how it's gonna to have to work, Jesus. We imagine that responding to Jesus' call requires that we be something other than who we are, some new holy version of ourselves. But as we see in Matthew's later descriptions of the disciples, they weren't transformed into paragons of certainty or purpose. They remained themselves, wonderful and fallible, courageous and cowardly, confused and confident. We're never going to be ready for the call. It comes to us as we are, imperfect disciples, called as we are, not as we imagine we need to be. Second, I think if the call came to me, I'd want to say, well, just, just wait a little, Jesus. I've got a lot going on right now. And I'll respond, well, later. It's not a good time. Let me get through my degree or my new job or through my wedding or through my grief. Let me work out my family life or call me when I don't feel so sad. On our deacon's retreat this weekend, we talked about how often in a place like Yale, we imagine life or happiness will be just beyond the next milestone. Real life, real fulfillment will begin then, after graduation, after that job, after I'm married, after I'm retired. But how in real life, even when that milestone is reached, there's always another hurdle ahead. Jesus doesn't ask, is it a good time? Because Jesus knows if we wait for the perfect time, it will never come. Jesus calls his hearers to repent, which simply means to turn around. It doesn't have all those, all that baggage that we usually think of. Repent means to turn around and to go in a new direction. It's an invitation to let go of the barriers between myself and God that are the very things that make me want to delay. Let me get my life together, God, and then I'll respond. But Jesus wants us in the middle of our untogether, complicated lives as we are imperfect and unready. Jesus, I've got to get these law school applications done. Let, talk to me after that. But Jesus calls us in the, this moment and his call is to the kingdom in the midst of today's worries in law school or out. Jesus calls us to follow now. Jesus doesn't call us out of life and into some idealized movie version of discipleship, but to be disciples exactly where we are. Repentance in the kingdom happen not in some far off time when everything will be settled, but in the unsettled time itself. This is the time to turn around and open our eyes and see the groaning creation longing for my decision. And third, and finally, I think my response to Jesus' call would be, this isn't a good time, Jesus. The world is such a mess. It's a terrible, confusing, overwhelming time. I can't even wrap my head around my faith in this time. And all I can think about is how awful things are. Wait until things are better, and then we'll talk. But as the quote from Isaiah says, the people who walked in darkness and oppression have seen a great light of liberation, not later, but now. The worst time is exactly when God acts. Classical rhetoric talks about the word kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, a passing moment in an argument in which an opening appears that the speaker must seize to push the argument through to completion. And Paul Tillich and other theologians took this Kairos idea to describe how the crises of history create an opportunity for, or indeed a demand for, a decision to seize and choose God's kingdom. This is time outside of normal time, a season when the kingdom of God does draw close, 
And it was a Kairos time 2,000 years ago when those disciples heard the call. And it's a Kairos time today when we come to church in spite of all that's going on in the world and hear our own call to follow. This time is a narrow window for decision that we, be that we believe can and will bring about God's kingdom. This is exactly the moment when we feel most helpless, when evil with its many faces seems to grin all around us. This is the moment God calls us to choose and act. When Jesus calls each of us by name and says, follow me. And of course our response is not me, not yet, not now. Because we know the path Jesus is calling us to leads to the cross. No one in their right mind would think that they are prepared, equipped, or emotionally strong enough to follow that path right now. But the beauty of the good news is that we are not in our right minds. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the message of the cross is foolishness to the world, but for us it is the power of God. We are fools for Christ, and we hear that intimate call as we mend our academic nets here at Yale, and though it makes no sense at all, we do turn and drop the nets and follow, and imperfect disciples that we are, still we follow him on his amazing, troubling, suffering, triumphant way, and in that foolishness we find the power of God. This path can feel unreal or impossible or naive, but our individual doubts can be overcome, as we'll see today, by our coming together, sustaining each other, even laughing together at what the world can only see as foolishness. This call is not an individual one or a lonely one. It comes to us alongside others who hear this same strange music that no one else can hear. So as we commission new student deacons today, we're asking them to commit to what we know is good news, that they and we and all our suffering neighbors are deeply loved by God and that God is acting in hidden ways to bring the light into the world, this world of oppression. God is moving and this is the moment, not some ideal time in the future. And we, not some perfect Christians, are the ones being called. And as we ask these deacons to commit themselves to this gospel, we are being asked to renew our commitment to hope and to act and to follow Jesus' way wherever it leads. Yes, this call can feel like a burden, an interruption, too big an ask for where we are right now, but it's not just one more thing on our list. It's liberation. It's community. It is, in fact, joy. Yes, it's a kind of foolishness, but still, we drop our nets and abandon our boats because Jesus is, in the end, beautiful and irresistible and fills all the empty places in our souls. Amen.
You may be seated. The church is its people, the living body of Christ. Today, we will recognize and commission leaders from amongst us to certain special tasks with the affirmation that all of us are called by God to our own ministries. We are thankful for the multiplicity of gifts in this church and lift up these deacons that they might inspire all of us to serve in our own ways. As the Church of Jesus Christ in this place, we enter into a covenant relationship with our student deacons. The office of deacon dates back to the earliest days of the church. St. Stephen the martyr was a deacon, as was well St. Philip the evangelist who called the Ethiopian eunuch, and Sister Phoebe the benefactor who served Paul in the church at Kenkre. St. Francis was a deacon. Deacons are called to offices of service to the community, a proclamation of the gospel, and leadership and worship. In our Yale church, the student de diaconate is a long and cherished tradition, calling student deacons to serve, s service and servant leadership. In calling these students to be deacons, we honor them and entrust them with a call to lead us and to serve us, as well as to lead and serve other students of the university. We are honored by their service and entrusted with their care and support. I now invite our new deacons to come forward and they'll introduce themselves. So students who are becoming a deacon this January, come on up. You can go ahead and line up. All right, if you just want to take a moment and briefly introduce yourself, that would be wonderful. Hello, my name is Daniel. I'm a freshman at Yale College in Berkeley. I'm Texas McLeod with you. Hi there, my name is Hannah. My pronouns are she, her. I'm from San Jose, California, and I'm currently a divinity student in religion and ecology here. Hi, my name is Madeline Keenan. I'm a first year in Polymer College, and I'm from Champaign, Illinois. Hi, my name is Creed. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a first year in Polly Murray College. Hello, I'm Singh or Louis. I am a first year in Franklin and I'm from Queens, New York City. Hi, my name is Abby. I go by she, her pronouns and I'm a first year in Franklin. Hi, my name is Katie. I'm a third year PhD student in uh, biology and I'm from Zambia. Aren't they wonderful? So, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> As we prepare to commission these students, I will join together in singing God of Our Journeys. Two of our choir members are going to come up and teach it. They'll sing it once, we'll sing it back. And then what's really fun about this piece is it's around. So this half of the room will be one, this half of the room will be two, and you'll follow Matthias and Sarah.
Beautiful, thank you. Students, we now have a few questions for you. In congregation, we have one for you as well, and you'll find it in your bulletin. Having considered this church's call to minister among us, will you commit to service as a deacon? If so, please say, I will. Will you commit to this ministry with your time, your talents, your heart, and your spirit, keeping before you the example of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will, relying on God's grace. I will, relying on God's grace. And do you, the living members of Christ's body, confirm this covenant made today and receive these students as your leaders and servants, promising to support them and encourage them? We do, relying on God's grace. And now I'll invite the returning deacons to come forward and join this group. In our different Christian traditions, change of status is marked in different ways. In some traditions, holy oil is used as in the rite of confirmation as a sign and seal of the presence and action of the Holy Spirit. In others, hands are laid on new ordinance, and this morning we will use these symbols in a different way to set aside our student leaders and commission them on our behalf to serve our congregation, our campus, and our city. So we'll use this holy oil to anoint each one. So we pray over this oil and say, Gracious God, creator of life and new life, at this time of new beginnings, bless this oil to be a sign of the seal under which we set these students apart to be servants and leaders in our church. By this sign, we testify that we see your Holy Spirit in them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we will actually anoint all of them because of COVID. Even our returning deacons have not gone through this right. We now move into the part of the rite where we will lay hands on our new deacons as we bless them and commission them. So I invite those who wish to join to stand, well, all to stand in body and spirit. For those that are near the deacons, I invite you to put a hand on their shoulder or on their head. And for everyone else that's further out, I invite you to lift your hands in blessing. Let us pray over our new deacons. Gracious God, we thank you for those who hear and answer your call to be deacons in your church. Bless and sanctify them with your spirit, these we call today. Lucas, Daniel, Andrea, Kim, Eva, Creed, Patrick, Madeline, Violet, Dennis, Rui, Hannah, Ketty, Naomi, Hannah, Morgan, and Abby. Bless and sanctify them that they may grow in faith, be filled with courage, increase in love, and grow in their knowledge of you. 
May they serve you and serve your people in this church and throughout our community. Amen. Amen. Let us celebrate our new deacon. You can return to your seats. Thank you. May we all be inspired as Pastor Ian preached to see them respond to Christ's call and think about what Christ is calling each of us to in our daily living. And now invite Benjamin to come forward for the invitation to the offering. Here at the University Church, we are blessed to be able to give all of the offerings we collect toward helping our neighbors in the New Haven community. This morning, our offering will go to support Sunrise Cafe. Sunrise Cafe provides a safe space for New Haven's food insecure and unhoused to rest, have conversations, and prepare for the day's challenges with a full stomach. Sunrise's free nutritious breakfast is served to all with warmth, friendship, compassion, kindness, dignity, support, and respect. As the ushers bring the offertory plates forward, you are invited to share so that others might receive. Please give generously. The offering will now be collected.
Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Give us grateful hearts, O God, for the many gifts of our lives, those we love, the work we have to do, the privileges we have been given. Inspire in us a passion for a more equal sharing of what you give. Accept these gifts as a sign of our commitment. Amen. before we send you on your way. You may be seated. First, wow, choir, it is so good to have you back. We are so blessed uh, in this church to have the music ministry that you provide us. So thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of wonderful weeks coming up uh, in worship. Next week, we have two of our favorite uh, texts. We'll be looking at Micah 6, the words that we always say for our closing benediction. And the gospel text is the Beatitudes. So it's sure to be a wonderful Sunday with good music. Uh, the following Sunday, February 5th, our very own Daryl Donnell will be preaching. And after worship, we will have Chapel on the Green lunch making. So that means we'll want as many of you are able to stay after worship to come up and help us. We'll make about 150 sandwiches and sack lunches that then later uh, from 1.45 to 3, Pastor Ian will be looking for about five volunteers uh, to help to distribute those lunches. There'll be a brief service, optional service, and then after uh, worship service, and then after that, uh, anyone who wishes to have a free meal will come to the green and we'll hand it out. Uh, the following week on February 12th, we're really excited to be able to bring back this annual tradition, COVID interrupted it a bit, of having our joint worship service with BK, the Black Church at Yale. Every year we alternate whether they come here or we go there, and this year we are going to be joining them where they worship every Sunday at the AFAM House or the Afro American Cultural Center at 211 Park Street. So if you come here, we won't be here, but we invite you to join us and notice that worship for them starts at 10, not 10.30. So if you can, uh, we invite you to get up a half an hour earlier and join us. It will be a wonderful day. Uh, a few other quick announcements. Catechesis has started up again. This is our student Bible study and dinner group. We meet on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. If you come to Catechesis, will you raise your hand? 
Yeah, we have a great group. We would love to have more students, undergrad and grad students come. If you wish, uh, you can let me know and I will add you to the email list so that you're always in the loop. On Saturday, February 11th, the day before we have our joint worship with the Black Church at Yale, we also have our annual congregational retreat. Um, this is a really wonderful day because it's a chance for our older adults and our students to get together and retreat. We go to Mercy by the Sea, which is run by the Sisters of Mercy. It's right on the ocean. It's where the deacons just were yesterday. It's a beautiful day. So if you're interested, you can sign up after church or there's a link to sign up in the email that goes out on Fridays. And finally, uh, Easter Sunday is uh, always a joyful day, in part because this is also the day that we baptize and confirm um, those that might be interested. So whether you are a student or adult, if you have not been baptized before and would like to learn more about what baptism could mean in your walk with Christ, please see Ian or I, and we would be happy to work with you. And also for those that would like to be confirmed or would learn more about what confirmation might mean for them, please see us and we can talk about that as well. Did I cover everything? All right, I invite you to stand in body and spirit and join me in these closing words from Micah. With what shall I come before the Lord? God has told you, O mortal, what is good. But to do justice and to love kindness and to move humbly with your God. Amen. Go now with the grace of God, with the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which surpasses all understanding, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore.